Good morning, everybody. Can I get a, a sign that uh, you hear me, Sarah? Thank you. So, hello, everybody. I'm Danielle Vieno, and I'm here to welcome you to ISEE Young on behalf of the whole local organizing committee. So I'll, I'll introduce, introduce the others in a moment. But first, I wanted to say that we are very excited to have all of you join us today for this agenda-packed virtual conference, so today and tomorrow. Our aim here at ISE Young is really to unite and showcase the research of students and new researchers in environmental epidemiology and exposure science. We hope that ISE Young 2021 will be fun, interactive, inspiring, and also educational. So we started with a bit of fun yesterday. We had two great kickoff events, thanks to everybody who organized those for us. And we just wrapped up with a refreshing morning yoga class. In our program, you'll see that we've invited a fabulous group of experts to give keynote lectures starting this morning, and also experts that are joining our networking sessions. And don't miss our special planning this is with renowned scientists discussing the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on current epidemi environmental epi research, and that is at the end of today. So watch out for that one. Must say, it's really been a delight working together with all the ISEE Europe and the Scientific Organizing Committee bringing this conference to you. Marluz is my co-chair. She's going to show you who they are in a moment. But first, I'll just take a moment to introduce the rest of our local organizing committee. So I hope they're ready to join me here on screen when I call out their name. First, please everyone give a warm welcome and hello to Marluz Eftins. She is the co-chair of ISEE Young uh, Local Organizing Committee with me and also the co-chair of today's opening plenary. Marluz is an assistant professor here at Swiss TPH. Marluz, say hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, Marluz. So, Anna, you're up next. We also have Anna Vicetto. She's a former Swiss TPH colleague, now a group leader at ISPM Bern in uh, Switzerland. So, Anna is also a member of the ISEE Europe Council. Anna. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Great. Now, I'm very happy to in introduce these next two um, people. We have Apolline Sosse and Alexandra Bugler. They are our two PhD students from our unit. And I tell you, they have done an enormous amount of work and brought so much energy to the planning of ISEE Young and really helping us bring this conference alive. So thank you very much, ladies. And please say hello. Hi, good morning. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you. Great. And so last but not least, I'm going to make a shout out to Sarah Thielesh. I, um, she's here behind the scenes with a whole group of student volunteers that are helping with Zoom and, and bringing all of this to us uh, these, these next few days. And you'll meet them throughout the conference, I'm sure. So that's all from me. I'm going to hand over to Marluz. She will carry on with the welcoming you to IZE Young 2021. Okay. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. So good morning, everyone. Marluz here. Um, in addition to our local organizers, I would also like to really thank the Scientific Organizing Committee, which is led by Benedict Schakma and Massimo, St Massimo Staporia. There are too many members to uh, list all of them, but you can see their names here on the screen. So we thank them for, um, first of all, reviewing all of the, the abstracts that came in, um, for uh, being on the awards committee, on our networking committee, and um, yeah, for helping out with putting together a very interesting scientific program for this conference. Um, so, in total, we have received 127 abstracts, which will be presented over these next two days. So you actually kept us in suspense about whether we would reach the 100 mark. And um, I must say that um, scientists tend to be very last minute. And so just 
the day before um, our submission um, deadline, we reached the 100 mark. So we were very happy with this result. Um, we also have 211 conference registrations. Again, uh, you kept us in suspense, but thanks University of Bielefeld, we made it to over 200 again. So who is all here? Um, I just wanted to show you some statistics. So um, it won't surprise you that as the organizing country, Switzerland is quite well represented. Um, but we also have a large delegation here from both Spain and Germany. And then what are we going to talk about over the next couple of days? Well, there is one um, all time favorite, I would say. Um, I think to no one's great surprise. So you will see a lot of air pollution talks, but actually there is a large diversity of other things that is represented in this uh, meeting. So uh, just to briefly mention green and blue space, built environment, weather and climate. Um, are, it's a very large diversity of, of topics. Um, the vast majority of these talks will be given by students. So here you will see that actually most of our speakers are eligible for uh, the awards that we're going to give out, which means they have student status. So make sure to um, do your best in your, in your talk and uh, to vote for the abstracts or vote for the talks that are your personal favorites. Um, Okay, so I think that gives you a little bit of a snapshot of who is all here at this conference. Um, have a good time presenting, learning and networking. I hope you look forward as much as I do. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen right now. And then it's time already uh, to introduce our first speaker of the day, Maria Forastet. She is an assistant research professor at IS Global. So, um, Maria, if you are ready, um, the screen is yours. Maria, have a try now. I'm sorry. My fault. <laughs> Oh, so good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, now I, I have my mic turned on. Perfect. So uh, good morning. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to give this presentation. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to present today and to give this overview on the health effects of noise. This is a topic I have been investigating for more than 12 years now, together with air pollution and other over environment factors. And well, as Marluz just showed, actually, uh, yeah, the submissions in IC Yang are uh, a lot about air pollution. And it's striking to see that still noise is not popping up as one of the most investigated factors, despite the fact that it's one of the uh, most harmful environmental uh, factors uh, that we have around. So I'm going to show you why noise is important. And well, first of all, why so? Um, Maria, could you just switch to presentation mode? Yeah, sure, sorry. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay, so actually environmental noise is very prevalent. And uh, if we focus on Europe, more than 20% of the people are exposed to levels that are considered to be too high according to the European recommendations during the daytime. But also more than 15% of the people at night are also exposed to levels that are considered to be too high. And uh, if we look at this figure, we can also see which are the main sources of noise. So road traffic noise is the main source in terms of exposure and followed by railway, aircraft noise and industrial noise. And this is the same pattern both inside and outside urban areas, though it is true that exposure inside urban areas is much higher. 
So what's the problem here? The problem is that uh, the number of exposed people that uh, I'm showing in this slide is based on the European recommendations. But actually there are now new WHO noise guidelines that you may, may be aware of. And according to these new guidelines, the recommended noise levels uh, to avoid harmful effects and protect health are now lower. In addition, these levels are now source specific. So as you can see in this slide, uh, they are a bit different between road, railway and aircraft noise. And indeed they are lower than the recommended European noise levels, but also uh, lower than the US recommended noise levels. So this means that more people uh, are exposed to levels that can be harmful for health. And for you to have a flavor of what these uh, thresholds mean, imagine that you are in front of a road with four lanes of traffic. So in that situation, you would be exposed to about 75 to 80 dB. But if you move far away from traffic and you listen to the background of the city, you would probably uh, be exposed to a level of about 50 dB. So what are these uh, recommended levels telling us? They are telling us that actually we need rather quiet environments that are free of bad sounds in order to avoid the adverse health effects of noise. So I would also like to focus your attention on the fact that these European noise levels uh, are recommendations. These are not legally binding levels. So what's the health impact, impact of environmental noise in Europe? So there are already some calculations. They are incomplete and probably underestimated, but road traffic noise has been estimated to be already the second most harmful environmental stressor in Europe, just after air pollution. But for some reason, we are not so concerned about it. In turn, it has been calculated that one million healthy, um, one million tallies are lost every year in Europe due to noise. This is updated information from 2020. And if we uh, uh, stratify this into different health outcomes, we can observe that 22 million people are affected by psychological distress. This is people that are highly annoyed. And this is not just annoyance that happens one day and disappears the day after. This is chronic annoyance and this is highly, uh, people that are highly annoyed. There are also uh, 48,000 new cases of ischemic heart disease uh, calculated every year, uh, 12,000 premature deaths due to environmental noise, 6.5 million people that suffer severe sleep disturbance due to noise. This is not mild sleep disturbance. This is really uh, about severity in this case. So imagine if we calculate uh, all the people that may suffer a range of sleep disturbances, even mild. And there are also almost 13,000 children that uh, may suffer cognitive impairment due to aircraft noise. So which are the biological mechanisms that are suggested for the effects of noise on health? So here we are focusing on long-term exposure. We are focusing on repeated environmental noise exposure. And this is why sources such as road traffic noise are so important because they are frequent and we are always exposed to them. So this may lead to a chronic effect. And there are several uh, pathways, biological pathways, but one of the main uh, uh, suggested pathways is through stress. Here we can split the stress into types. First, the perceived stress. Here we're talking about annoyance and this creates a psychological distress. So here we have a cognitive reaction. We really realize of the noise and we get annoyed. But this is about persistence and all, persistent annoyance. On the other hand, there is the non-perceived stress, which leads to a physiological stress that we are not aware of. So what does it mean? Let's imagine that you are in a room and there is the air conditioning turned on. You don't realize of the noise of this air conditioning, but once it is turned off, 
you relax. So there was some tension and this tension that you did not realize you have is about this physiological stress. So both uh, types of stress may change our behavior and lifestyles and there is uh, research on this topic and all of it could also create sleep alteration and there's uh, quite a lot of evidence on this sleep alteration. So either through direct pathways of stress or through sleep, this may lead to a cascade of biological reactions and the most commonly addressed are the hormonal alteration and rise of glucocorticoids, but also the alteration of the autonomous nervous system. But nowadays there's also research about the effects of noise through stress related to oxidative stress, inflammation, or even immune response. So you can imagine that under this situation, there are many potential health effects of noise. And these boxes here uh, at the bottom uh, refer to those outcomes that have been studied. And in red, you can see which are the outcomes for which there is better quality evidence. So for the sake of time, I'm going to select some of these main health effects. But I would like to um, explain them in the framework of the noise guidelines, which were published in 2018. You may be aware of them, and actually they were based on eight systematic reviews that gathered uh, research uh, until 2014. These were the topics that were um, addressed in these noise guidelines. And there was also a nice systematic review about interventions, and I found that uh, very interesting because, uh, of course, we need action. So if we focus on the adverse birth uh, um, effects, um, in the WHO noise guidelines, it was concluded that there was at the time very low quality evidence for uh, an effect of any of the environmental noise sources on adverse birth outcomes. But that was due to the limited number of studies and the quality of the study designs. Now there is new evidence for road traffic noise. And as you can see in this very nice meta-analysis, um, they, they concluded here that there is now a moderate quality evidence for the association between road traffic noise and reduced birth weight. And for the rest of birth outcomes, there's still very low evidence uh, or no association observed. So importantly here, um, these results were robust to adjustment for air pollution. Regarding mental health, here there are many outcomes and it's very difficult to summarize the evidence, but there are two reference systematic reviews, the one for the WHO guidelines and another review that has more recently informed the UK guidelines. So overall, um, the conclusion here is that further studies are needed but both reviews uh, coincide that there is moderate quality evidence for behavioral problems in children related to road and railway noise. On the other hand, there is low quality evidence for depression and anxiety related to road traffic noise. Of course, after this review, there have been more studies and it's not my aim to cover all of them, but I would like to show you a couple of studies, the first one observed that it was not so much about the objective uh, noise measures, but about noise annoyance. And here in this study uh, in Switzerland, we observed that transportation noise annoyance was associated to incidence of depression uh, in this in the longitudinal study. But although I'm not showing it in this table, in mediation analysis, we also observed that there were indirect effects of road traffic noise and aircraft noise on incidents of depression that were mediated by noise annoyance. So this is in line with the idea that the um, psychological distress is also important. So noise annoyance, which is the standard representation of this psychological distress should be also considered. And this other study is in line with the previous results and they also observed that noise annoyance due to different sources uh, was associated with depression and anxiety 
five years after and also with the sleep disturbance. So what about cognitive impairment? Cognitive impairment has been actually uh, studied for a long time and both the WHO systematic review and the UK systematic review uh, have concluded that there is moderate quality evidence for the association of long-term exposure to aircraft noise and decreased reading comprehension in children and also with uh, worse long-term memory. Here I'm um, presenting two figures of two different studies in two different populations that are 12 years apart. But in both studies, they observed the same pattern. So they, they saw that children that went to schools that were exposed to higher levels of aircraft noise, aircraft noise they had uh, worse reading comprehension. But I would like to show you an early intervention on the effects of aircraft noise on cognitive impairment. And I like this one very much because it's a natural experiment. So here there was an airport that was closing and a new one that was opening. So the researchers had the opportunity to do a pre-post evaluation and observe how cognitive impairment in children changed with the closure and opening of these airports. So what did they observe? They observed that indeed aircraft noise was associated with worse reading comprehension, memory and speech perception. But interestingly, and this is good news, they also observed that uh, little by little, children recovered their abilities after the closure of the airport. So this action at the source is very important and may revert uh, some of these cognitive impairment problems. Regarding road traffic noise, this is a whole different story. So I, I haven't mentioned it, but each, each noise source may have a different health effect. But in this case, the problem is that uh, there are very few studies on road traffic noise and cognition and they, they are all cross-sectional. So uh, the evidence for this association was rated as very low so far. So there's a need for longitudinal studies. And in Barcelona, under the BREATHE project, we are studying the association of road traffic noise with cognitive development in children after one year. And here in this graph, um, these are preliminary results you can observe that actually children that go to schools that are exposed to uh, higher road traffic noise levels, they have a slower cognitive development over one year compared to children that go to schools exposed to lower road traffic noise levels. But to me, the most striking are the effects of noise on cardiovascular health. So already in the systematic review of the WHO guidelines, we could observe and conclude that there was high quality evidence for the association of road traffic noise with incidence of ischemic heart disease. So here you can see the meta-analysis and we could reach this conclusion because most of the studies were either covert or case control studies. So they had the longitudinal design and they also had few biases. For other types of cardiovascular outcomes, the evidence so far is rated as low or very low, according to the GRADE system, because most of the studies were cross-sectional. This is the case for uh, the association between road traffic noise and hypertension in adults. So as you can see here, there are many studies, but they are all cross-sectional except one. So even if we found an association, the quality is rated as very low. So as I said, this happens with many outcomes, but after the system, this systematic review, there has been more research. And for example, in Switzerland, in the Swiss National Court, in 4.4 million adults, we observed an association for all 
transportation noise sources with uh, increased risk of myocardial infarction mortality. And as you can see in the figure on the left, these associations were robust to adjustment for different air pollutants. In contrast for air pollution, the association was only observed in single exposure models. So once we adjusted by noise, the association between uh, air pollutants and myocardial infarction mortality uh, was attenuated and was even uh, non-existent for NO2. But there has been also recently more research and longitudinal research about uh, objective, uh, about obesity, uh, metabolic effects then. And actually uh, in the WHO noise guidelines, it was already reported that there was moderate quality evidence for aircraft noise, but this was based only on one cohort study. And actually new evidence has, uh, uh, has been now published. Um, there are some studies that have um, evaluated all the transportation noise sources together, and they have observed also associations for road traffic noise and risk of obesity. So this is the case in Sweden and the case uh, in Switzerland. But I would like also to mention that regarding metabolic effects, uh, it's also important to study the effects on diabetes. And the WHO guidelines concluded that there was generally still too few studies, though there was moderate quality for some of the associations because uh, the designs were uh, called studies. And in this meta-analysis that we carried uh, out afterwards, uh, we could observe that indeed there are few studies, but that yeah, there is uh, an association for road traffic noise and diabetes and aircraft noise and diabetes. And actually, if we pull it together, transportation noise is associated with diabetes. And uh, most of these studies were uh, cohort studies. So um, for the sake of time, I'm um, moving to a short discussion and conclusions. So uh, some of the bottom lines of these presentations are that the noise guidelines now are recommending lower noise levels and source specific noise levels to protect health. That the evidence so far confirms that noise is a major public health concern. Um, Road traffic noise alone is considered to be the second most harmful environmental uh, factor for, uh, for health after air pollution. So this means based on this evidence that uh, we should enforce legally binding noise limits and interventions. However, there are still many research gaps as you have to have observed. And uh, this means also that the impact is likely underestimated and that more and better research is needed. I would like to raise the point that there is a lack of evidence for vulnerable populations and we uh, really need to uh, carry out more research on vulnerable populations. But it's also important to use quality noise exposure assessment and to study lower noise levels. So I would like to highlight the fact that in many studies there is there could be quite a high exposure misclassification and a tendency to report no associations because of this non-differential exposure misclassification. So um, it's important to be careful, particularly with the administrative maps, such as the European noise maps, because sometimes the lower level that is used is uh, too high already, and we may have no contrast and in addition, uh, they may not be always precise enough. And further research is needed that considers uh, other noise characteristics beyond average noise levels. And uh, as we observed, perception, noise annoyance, and sensitivity is also important. And finally, there are non-acoustic factors that should be also considered such as insulation, behaviors against noise, the ability of people to escape from noise and have access to quiet areas, ventilation and orientation uh, of the rooms towards the street. 
So with this, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And you can contact me in the email that you can see here if you want to continue with this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, also Maria. I see there's a lot of questions coming in already, so I'm going to start right off with the first one from Ron Kaffeler. Um, so he's asking, there is also evidence for an association between mental health and air pollution. So um, do typically those studies about noise, I guess, have they adjusted their models for air pollution and what are the findings in terms of the possible confounding? Thank you very much for this question. Uh, I like it very much because actually in general there are more noise studies that adjust for air pollution than air pollution studies that adjust for noise. And actually uh, noise, in, in noise epidemiology um, we are quite aware of the need to adjust for air pollution. And I cannot tell now by heart how many of these studies adjusted for air pollution, but it is quite of a common practice. And in many, many studies already in different fields and outcomes that may have this mutual um, confounding, uh, we have observed that this confounding is generally uh, not so big. It may happen that in certain populations such as um, the populations that I have studied together with Nina Kunzli uh, in Regicor in Girona, that we find higher correlations between noise and air pollution simply because of the uh, built environment. And in those cases, it's important to pay attention and find ways to disentangle these effects. But in general, uh, if we uh, take all the populations together and carry out meta-analysis, this confounding will become um, less of an issue and we may find that there are actually independent effects of both air pollution and noise on, this, uh, on these outcomes. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, Lukasz Adamkiewicz is asking, would you suggest uh, to do any case studies about low exposure zone noise reduction? Um, so he is starting um, a discussion in Poland about this and wants to know what is your opinion about this. Mm, sorry, I'm not sure I got, uh, I understood the question. Okay, I'm reading it. Would you suggest a case study mm -hmm. about low exposure zone noise reduction? This would be crucial for me. In Poland, we are starting a discussion on stricter low exposure zone bills in parliament. Yes, I think it's very important to carry out this type of studies and studies based on interventions and yeah, real uh, interventions that are happening in cities. These are a big opportunity to, to, to provide strong evidence on the effects of noise and to find uh, the best interventions to, to avoid noise and protect health. Yeah, I think it's very important. Okay. Um, so Benedict says, hey Maria, great presentation. Could you please talk about the challenges of estimating noise exposure for epidemiological studies? Yeah, thank you very much Benedict for this question. Um, yes, there are several challenges indeed. The first uh, challenge I think we have is that there is administrative data out there. There are noise maps that can be downloaded and used, but we don't always know how good these, these maps are. And um, we are blinded to it. And maybe we are using them and there is too much exposure misclassification. And then we found no associations and um, this may be due to this uh, exposure misclassification. But uh, the other problem with these maps, and I'm, this is just one of the, the issues, is that they are meant for, for, for administrative purposes. So for example, in Europe, uh, the European Noise Directive recommends to, I mean, obliges to carry out these 
uh, noise maps, but um, they are only needed for um, for people exposed to the level to to levels that are higher than the recommended levels. So it means that that these maps may only um, check um, who is exposed above uh, starting at 55 dB. So this is already too high because we know that effects start at lower levels. And if we have maps that start at 55 dB, uh, we don't have uh, contrast to study the health effects. But um, luckily enough, uh, now many of these maps are providing lower levels, but still we don't know which is the mm, precision of the noise levels at this low range because it's more difficult to characterize noise at the lower range. So uh, what I recommend basically is to always involve some noise expert when you are carrying out uh, studies on, on noise and, uh, and uh, noise epidemiology, or when you use noise together with other exposures um, or even yeah, in exposome uh, projects, but of course in exposome projects, there are hundreds of exposures. And um, other, other problems that we have to, to deal with are um, the fact that shielding is very important for noise. So the orientation of, of the houses towards the source is important. Understanding which microenvironment is relevant for noise effects is relevant. So um, there is the idea and uh, the, the evidence supports the idea that nighttime noise is more important for some of the outcomes. So it means that we, we should try to characterize noise exposure in the bedrooms. So it's important to uh, look at the orientation of the bedrooms. Um, we, um, we did this for the first time in 2014 to look at the association between noise air pollution and hypertension in Girona in Spain. And it was important to actually look at the bedroom per se and also to estimate the indoor noise. When we did so, uh, we did observe uh, more consistent associations with high blood pressure. So um, these are some of the some of the challenges in noise exposure that I think we have to 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 consider. Thanks for that, Maria. Yeah, there is definitely a lot of challenges in exposure, and um, it's nice to hear you uh, put some words to that, and hopefully some of these topics will come up throughout the conference. Um, we're going to close with one last question. I mean, there's many in the chat, and we thank everybody for those. So we've captured those, and we'll, we'll share them um, with you, Maria, directly. Um, yeah, so the last question is from Josie, and she's asking, is there research on noise? Oh, first of all, she says, many thanks for your great presentation. I think everybody agrees with that statement. Um, is there also research on noise and health outcomes for megacities in LMICs? So megacities and low-income, low-middle-income. There is, in, there is uh, some research, but there is indeed to lead to, there are too few studies in low and middle income countries. That's true, and we, we should we should try to 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 do more research in this respect. Definitely, yes. Thanks for the question. Great. All right. Um, I think we are keeping a very good Swiss uh, keeping well to Swiss time today. So um, I'd like to thank you. Maria, maybe Marluz, you have a, another word of your own before we move Thanks, on. Thanks, Maria. Really <laughs> great presentation and a very uh, concise overview of all re noise research so far, Maria. Um, so uh, hope you can stick around for a little bit and see you soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, Maria. Thank you. So now it's um, my pleasure to introduce... Melissa Penny. She's a professor here at uh, Swiss TPH and she has uh, more than 14 years experience on developing mathematical and computational models and so today she's going to talk to us about mathematical modeling to address contemporary issues in infectious uh, disease and global health. So if Melissa is ready to take over the screen, I'm very happy to welcome you. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. I hope you can hear me and see my screen. We hear you and see your screen, but I think we're still spotlighting. Okay. There you go. <laughs> thank you. So thank you, I'm Danielle, for this introduction and kind introduction, and also for this invitation to speak to you today, um, particularly because I'll be speaking to you on a topic that's not featured strongly in this um, conference, although you do have a discussion on COVID later today. Um, so it's um, with pleasure that I get to meet you all virtually and I'll give you just a, a tour de force of mathematical modelling addressing infectious diseases and global health and I'll be happy to take questions at the end. And so today um, you've uh, starting your exciting conference where you've got some hard sciences on environmental exposures and epidemiology, but the topic I'll talk to you today is slightly different and we'll be focusing a little bit on global health and public health, and in particular, how to have impact, or how can we have impact with quantitative sciences. So I'm focusing on infectious diseases today and the role of mathematical modeling in informing decisions at the global and country level um, public health decision-making. My background, as Danielle mentioned, is on um, mathematical modeling, uh, in particular in infectious diseases. Primarily, I've worked in the space of malaria for the last 14 years, and more recently, as many of the applied mathematicians are saying, also more recently in SARS-CoV-2. And so as part of my work is this, uh, on COVID-19 and the current pandemic, we've been informing the um, science task force here in Switzerland with some models on the interaction between social distancing and vaccines. So today I'd like to talk to you just a little bit, give you an overview and reflection on the role of infectious disease modeling uh, in the past and where we are currently today in malaria and SARS-CoV-2. So some gen general reflections that goes beyond infectious diseases in fact and, and leads into the quantitative sciences in your science domain of um, exposure and epidemiology. So <clears throat> as you're, you're aware that the role of any quantitative science, whether it's data analysis or modeling, is really to provide some additional insight. And the process that, under which you do this is generally you have a question or a hypothesis that's driven by yourself from an academic setting, a research setting, or it's driven by a stakeholder, whether it's a um, product developer or the WHO or country level decisions on um, health decisions. And the process is such that you have a question, you have potentially some data, whether it's high quality or there's quite some uncertainty in, you undertake some analysis and you get some insights. The role of mathematical modeling here in infectious diseases is often to go beyond the data by using mechanistic models that are informed by current biological understandings or the data themselves. And then the mechanistic model means that we can change aspects of the underlying biology or the underlying interventions to see what would happen beyond the data that we've already observed. And as we undertake with statistical analysis of the data, the idea is that the modeling itself provides some additional evidence to inform some decisions. And in the same way that your data analysis that you undertake is not a linear process, you know that it's iterative. As you go through the process of your data analysis or your mathematical modeling, it, you really refine the question or the hypothesis um, as you get more insights. So it's not a one-stop linear process, it's iterative and often the process itself is far more important than the final model because the model itself and the process of data analysis gives you a lot more insights to inform these final decisions. And in infectious disease space, which I'm sure you're all aware, even with geospatial modeling with, um, for instance, on your environmental exposures, the model itself or the, or the analysis or the map that you've pr produced is never the decision. It's really just guiding the thinking in combination with all the other evidence pieces and stakeholders to inform decisions. So it brings me to my first reflection that uh, in this space and also your research space that the context really matters and the question really matters and the stakeholder. And in addition to this is also you, the model yourself, the you, um, your statistician, but also the quality of the data and the data that you have to inform the questions or the models. 
And when we reflect on infectious disease modelling, we've all been exposed to quite some modelling over the last 12 months with the outbreak of SARS-CoV-2. Um, in, in the media, even it became quite important to understand exponential growth. So here I'm going to list the several phases of modelling that we have for infectious diseases. The same would apply also for other areas. In, for example, epidemic outbreaks, the first role of modeling is really to understand disease dynamics. So we saw this quite strongly last year with the new disease. There were simple models to really, first of all, understand exponential growth, understand what the next two weeks may bring us if we don't intervene. And that's very simple models. It goes beyond um, just forecasting to really understand um, what might be ahead of us. But it also allows us to understand the epidemiology as we're acquiring more evidence. So we're able to um, incorporate both the data and the models to understand biological aspects of a new disease, but also the epidemiology. The second phase is to go beyond these smaller short-term forecasting to really understand how we might be able to have an intervene. And last year, we all saw in the media quite some examples of this, where modeling was used to make some relative comparison of different uh, strategies for social distancing and closures uh, for the SARS-CoV-2 epidemic. Important to note in this phase of modeling, it goes beyond the initial biological understandings to really understanding what could be rather than what will be. And I cannot emphasize enough that the role here, because it's sometimes taken out of context, is not to predict how many deaths we might have if we don't intervene. It's really to show what the difference is between the intervention strategies. So it's a relative comparison between the different options of doing nothing versus a whole package of interventions. And the third phase of this modeling is to move beyond these models that provide some way to look at comparison between scenarios to really a much more predictive modeling in decision making. And this often involves models that have a lot more heterogeneity in them, capture many different aspects of health systems, the biology of the disease, the epidemiology, the population that you're considering. And here it, there might be predictions, they're predictive models, but it's still a comparison between different scenarios in the model that inform the thinking. And as an example, uh, here I've shown some examples for malaria, which I'll come back to in a few more slides. The idea here is to inform, for example, uh, WHO decisions on a new vaccine, how cost effective is it? And to be able to make that estimate, you have to have absolute predictions of number, number of deaths expected to be averted over a short period of time and how much it costs. So the, the absolute prediction is not the important, it's also the comparison to weigh off between other economic decisions that might be um, uh, part of the decision from WHO. It's also to extrapolate beyond clinical studies. So here, this is an example where I'm, I'm showing a plot from a, a paper that was, um, and work that was written for WHO to look at malaria vaccines, how many deaths will be averted given the clinical trial analysis and if we extrapolated to different settings. On the right, the other example of looking at this really more predictive modeling is work that was undertaken by Dr. Manuela Runge, who previously was at Swiss TPH, but now at Northwestern University in Chicago. She worked with um, many of the modelers at Swiss TPH, including Emily Parton, to work with the Tanzanian National Malaria Control Program to provide modeling that looked at their different strategies. So the Mal National Malaria Control Program in Tanzania had strategies for the next five years. And the question posed to Emily and Manuela were, how, um, what's the relative cost effectiveness between these strategies? How impactful are they likely to be? Will they succeed in meet meeting our targets of control and elimination? And here, although the model was quite predictive, had quite some information from different epidemiological parameters to go into the model, the comparison was still between the different scenarios, despite making absolute predictions of cases averted in different regional settings. And so given these phases of modeling that I've just touched on, I would like to just give you an overview of what's happened in malaria over more than 100 years of infectious disease modeling before moving to COVID just to discuss where we are in these phases of modeling in SARS-CoV-2 and how we can have impact in science and in global health. 
So malaria, uh, you're aware, is a uh, parasite disease that's transmitted by mosquitoes. The disease burden and how we intervene really depends on all of these factors of the host, the human host, the parasite dynamics itself, the different mosquitoes that transmit, and importantly, also the environment and the health system in which this disease is placed. So the environment, the climatic um, setting for the vectors, the weather and seasonal transmission uh, to support year long or um, peaks epidemic transmissions within a year, but also the health system to deploy different tools and to treat clinical cases. So this view of malaria provides you a brief overview of how complex the disease is. If you're going to use mathematical modeling, you need to capture all of these or some of these or the important aspects here. And this was recognized as um, far back as the end of the 1800s when the physician, Dr. Ronald Ross, elucidated the link between mosquitoes and the malaria parasite that had induced fevers, this malaria fever. And even at the beginning of the 1900s, he used mathematical modeling to not just bring the whole picture of malaria transmission into a framework, but to understand how much of the different factors influence the result. And even in 1916 with Hilda Hudson, they uh, were able to use very simple mathematical models to show how, uh, sorry, intervening in different parts of the mosquito life cycle have a larger impact on disease burden. And they introduced this concept of pathometry, which is these threshold concepts um, to, to understand modeling, but also to understand diseases. And this was the first uh, effective reproductive number or the reproductive number that you've heard quite a lot about um, in SARS-CoV-2 transmission in the last 12 months. So the history of a lot of infectious disease modeling um, is quite large, um, including going back to smallpox, but here the um, effective reproductive number comes back uh, to the history of malaria. And so since this beginning of using model to, models to identify knowledge gaps and to understand where to intervene has progressed quite a lot in the last 100 years. But underneath all of the improvements in models, the complexity of models is still this basic understanding of trying to understand a disease, identify knowledge gaps and test hypotheses. So the value in science and also in public health still remains the same. It's to make predictions underlying to understand the disease or, and how to intervene. And so over the last 100 years, we've moved from quite simple models. The models of Ronald Ross were later used in the 1960s during the WHO malaria eradication campaign and to use this concept of threat, this threshold concept for the R0 to look at uh, where to intervene on the mosquito, whether to kill adult mosquitoes or to use larvicide, uh, was used in the 1960s, but to today where we have much more complex models and that importantly account for just much more heterogeneity that becomes important as you basically understand with all of your exposure modeling, your geospatial maps, um, and, and also with um, environmental aspects, you've, you realize heterogeneity really plays an important role to understand disease uh, markers, biomarkers, um, exposure, influence on mental health. And that's the same with malaria. This heterogeneity is now captured in quite some complex models and they've been used for a diverse range of questions. Importantly, also uh, consistent with your epidemiology studies, there's a lot of data now. It's occurring quite a lot for infectious diseases as well. And these are biomarkers such as um, within host parasite densities. There's epidemiological relationships that inform all of these models, which is exposure, or in this case, it's um, malaria, mosquito exposure to your clinical incidence relationships. There's um, malaria indicator surveys, so you've got all your health surveys, um, different types of epidemiological outcomes in those surveys. There's malaria um, surveys from countries. There's climatic data that informs a lot of these models and also funding bodies with their monitoring and evaluation and funding also for uh, interventions. And now more recently, genomic and phylogenetic analysis and mobility data is informing these models. The questions are diverse and where they have impact in science, uh, it, 
and global health. It depends on the question. I've shown four examples, two I've already discussed here, which is um, strategic planning within countries. The most important aspect to, to emphasize here is that this is done very much in iteration with the strategic planners themselves. Same for the WHO malaria vaccines. It's an iterative process to be able to have impact. You have a question, you undertake some analysis, and it's a back and forth dialogue uh, explaining the results and also answering questions and updating the models. Uh, some other examples is really to understand burden of disease at country level or global level. These are geospatial mapping, so extrapolating beyond the data. But this group here, the Malaria Atlas Project, has also provided analysis where they've linked their geospatial maps with uh, mechanistic models of malaria, where they can then estimate the impact of different interventions and extrapolate beyond prevalence data to mortality, to mortality estimates. And of course, WHO themselves uses modeling to understand um, moving forward, how much more funding would be needed to accelerate uh, malaria control and elimination. And so these questions are quite diverse. And I just want to reflect that none of these questions are more important than the other. It really, really depends on the stakeholder and who you're answering um, some insights with, uh, providing insights with. And this goes the same for uh, COVID as well, the questions are being driven by quite some different aspects in the community, whether it's the academic research partners, scientists, all the way through to country level uh, policymakers. And just to reflect before I move to SARS-CoV-2 is that I mentioned there were three phases of modeling, or at least this is my reflection on the phases of modeling. It's also not a linear process. I may have taken you back to the very beginning of malaria to discuss understanding disease dynamics through to predictive modeling today, but just to note that this understanding disease dynamics for malaria, despite the disease we've had modeling on for over 100 years, we still undertake quite simple model to understand um, biological unknowns, for example, on parasite diversity within a population, drug resistance, uh, and through to even simple modeling to understand the combination of interventions for even developing new um, anti-malarial treatment. And so now to end, I'm just going to talk very briefly about SARS-CoV-2 modeling and the role within Switzerland. Um, the examples shown here are also happening in many other countries. So today we know that we've had quite some modeling and estimation of reproductive numbers to really support understanding disease dynamics, but also giving a snapshot of trends today. And more recently we've seen uh, more complex models being able to look at the comp it, it is complex interplay between the non-pharmaceutical interventions so these lockdowns social distancing closure of shops and so on um, and the interaction of that with vaccines and the reason there's quite some extensive modeling is today we know there's quite there's some data uncertainty we still don't know exactly how the vaccine will work um, with the new variants of concern we've got some very promising um, trial results and then also now uh, results from the implementation of vaccines in several companies at uh, countries. So, but this means we still have some unknown questions that the modeling can inform this relative comparison between different strategies, but also understand how it's changed disease burden in risk groups as we're rolling out these vaccines. And so within Switzerland, just to give you a tour de force of the types of modeling that's been ongoing in the Swiss National Science Task Force, um, they've been estimating the effective reproductive number. This is work led by Tanya Stadler at the um, ETHZ, also here based in Basel. And this effective reproductive number uh, has been calculated by many uh, here in Switzerland. It's calculated to really give a snapshot of the current trend um, within different cantons or also nationally. Just a note to, on data and uncertainty here, the data informing these effective reproductive number, which tells us is the epidemic growing exponentially or are we able to keep cases down and um, decrease them? It, the data going into these are quite uncertain due to reporting, but also um, capturing asymptomatic cases and people not being tested. And I have some questions here that you can reflect on yourself. Should it be used for decision-making? I will tell you my opinion that it is one epidemiological parameter 
that's informative but should not be used in isolation. And I'm sure you find this the same with your environmental exposures. You would not base any decision on one biomarker or one epidemiological parameter to uh, conclude um, current trends or impacts on public health. And so this is the same for the effective reproductive number. It's useful, to, it gives you a snapshot of the current trend. It doesn't tell you what's going to happen in the future. It tells you what's happening about 10 days ago. And so it should be combined with other epidemiological parameters uh, to make decisions. Uh, moving forward, it's also probably across everyone's mind at the moment that we're unfortunately in a potential pandemic within a pandemic with the new variants of concern. And modeling here is being used also within the task force to take quite sparse sequencing data to make sure that we remove any biasing in these sequencing to really understand the growth of these variants of concern within Switzerland. And I guess in the next months, we will see how this plays out. And hopefully as we have increased surveillance, we can also have a much stronger um, hold or estimate of how much transmission advantage these variants have to date. It's still quite uncertain, but the estimates of those relative advantages rely on modeling. We can also use modeling and have used modeling to understand um, what's happening in the health system. So this is again a snapshot of disease impact on our health system. So the group led by um, Professor Van Berkel at ETH has been uh, collating and working with the Swiss Army to understand ICU capacity today. But not just the ICU capacity today, been incorporating simple models, he's able to predict the next 10 days ICU um, occupancy expectancy, which has a huge impact on resource mobilization if we start hitting limits within cantons. And without these simple models, we wouldn't be able to do the forecasting. We also have phylogenetic analysis. Um, I mentioned the new variants of concern. The phylogenetic analysis gives us snapshots from the past, but also starts us to understand the trends of imported cases and interesting most important for the new variants of concern and how the um, the virus evolves and also um, replaces each other and lastly of course within the task force we're also using mechanistic models to look at the interaction between vaccines and non-pharmaceutical interventions here i'm just giving you a, a snapshot of some work that we've undertaken looking at the first wave this is led by andrew shaddock um, with my group here at swiss dph um, looking at the impact of the first wave and how delays to decisions to lock down would have led to increasing mortality and ongoing within the task force and for the federal council we've been providing um, um, new estimates of the vaccine into play with um, the relaxation of measures in the forthcoming months. And so to end, I would just like to make a comment. You've seen a tour de force of the science. I've touched a little bit on the impact and our role as modelers to have um, some, to provide additional evidence for decision-making. And as a final um, reflection, just thinking about the role of quantitative sciences, any discipline, whether it's infectious diseases or also exposures or environmental epidemiology, that as a quantitative scientist, if you're working in this field, you really have significant power and your power is that you can um, understand the data that you have. You can elucidate relationships, you can understand trends, you can even with mechanistic models go beyond um, the current understanding to guide thinking. And with that power, you have a huge amount of responsibility to, to communicate and um, really put the caveats around both data and model uncertainty. And also, um, although you might be able to provide this evidence, it's very hard to know your impact, um, especially at the time that you're providing it. So the influence that you have, it can be great, but it's very hard to to quantify. So all I would like to end on is to say, if you're working in quantitative sciences in whatever fields, go with the power you have, uh, communicate your results and do some great analysis. And with that, I would like to thank you and open the floor to questions and just acknowledge my partners that I've referenced some of their work here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Melissa. And um, I mean, us here at Swiss TPH, just to follow up on your last words there about your influence and stuff, I think it's been very clear to everybody here that you've been very influential in, in the, all the work that's been going on in this area over the, the past year. So congratulations on that. And thank you very much for a nice talk.
So we do have some uh, questions here for the discussion. First, we have from uh, Anna Vicetto. She's saying, thanks, Melissa. Melissa, sorry. It's a very interesting presentation. And she also says that we are doing this special plenary this afternoon. She's calling it an apero to really discuss some of these topics later on. What she'd like to ask you is um, something about the lessons learned, in particular, um, the, the pace of the new research advances that have taken place in mathematical modeling. Um, what does this, you know, and how this might be used um, in future crises? Do you have some reflections mm -hmm. there? Yeah, that's a <laughs> fantastic question. Thank you, Anna. Maybe um, a difficult one in, in an essence, I feel like um, right now mathematical modeling has progressed quite a lot, um, but the value of it is really hard in different spaces. Like I feel like in malaria, we've won the battle. We're able to communicate well. Uh, I think, well, hopefully we can communicate well and it's used well, but in newer spaces, I think my understanding, having seen what happened in SARS-CoV-2, you have the same battle plays out. You first have to win new people over with the value of the modeling, but also the limitations. So it's, it's two, twofold. You, you don't want to overemphasize the value because um, there's, there's really still some uncertainty with it. So I, yeah, I, I guess the lessons learned are perhaps keep at it, be communicate the caveats and the limitations, but really, really try to communicate the value and be iterative in your dialogue. That's the one thing I think we've learned with Malara. It only works if there's a user network and can continue to communicate and go back and forward with the question with the, the correct stakeholders. Thanks for that. So there's another question here um, from, I'm sorry, I might uh, say this incorrectly, uh, Yumurama. So thank you again for the great presentation. What are the challenges in incorporating time and space varying factors such as air pollution, climate change forecasting in the disease prevalence in mathematical modeling? Yeah, great question, thank you. Yeah, this is, you know, of course, all of us with machine learning is coming up. We've seen that geospatial modeling is kind of quite exciting at the moment. And then we've been adapting a lot of those methods in mechanistic modeling as well. I think. For, I can speak from the malaria space maybe, and, and maybe it has some, some uh, might be it answers your question. I think the geospatial modeling has taken into account quite a lot of um, climatic and ecological differences in projecting beyond the data we have on today's disease burden, given the past. So we have some handle of the influence of those environmental factors, I guess. In terms of climate change, it's a little bit more difficult because I think you're still having to go beyond the data you have right now. And so there is still, it, I think the use is still highlighting spots under which you would need to have surveillance of mosquito densities changing or mosquitoes invading new places. And maybe the simplest example is for instance, Stephen I, Stephen's eye mosquito invading Africa and particularly in Ethiopia is completely changing the disease prevalence and it's harder to kill this mosquito um, with our traditional vector control. So I think that the value there, I think is um, looking forward is um, highlighting hotspots for continued surveillance because of climate change. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, there is another question here. So this is from uh, Jerome. During the last uh, year, there have been many models uh, about COVID. Some of them did quite poor predictions. So how do you validate the models and how do you deal with the errors? Good yeah. question. <laughs> An age old question. Yes, yeah. there's, there's always that quote, we're always wrong. The models are always wrong, but actually mm -hmm. they, they're often wrong in retrospect because you show, particularly in epidemic, epidemic modeling, you show what could happen if you didn't intervene. And of course, in a new disease, you also don't have all of the information to understand the epidemiology or the case fatality rates. So there should be some level of uncertainty communicated with them. And yes, there has been some wild predictions made. Um, hopefully they've been able to communicate how they've been wrong and, and adapt to them. With speaking on errors with stakeholders, I think trying to understand what you, when you include uncertainty in your predictions, you have to be very clear what that means 
and what it doesn't mean. And what we do like to do in this case is provide different scenario analysis. So if you've got some unknown, for example, a very good question, the exact role of the vaccines, yes, it prevents disease severity at the moment for SARS-CoV-2. We don't exactly know how much onward transmission might be uh, occur, even if you get infected once you're vaccinated. So what we do is we do scenarios, we look at the extreme values of those assumptions to, to really sh to show that at this point, we're not fully certain and so these are the two different um, outcomes that might be possible depending on your assumption of the vaccines, for instance. But this is, again, the responsibility of the modeler to try and communicate. Yes, you run a risk that sometimes you're not listened to, but at least if you have it documented, you've communicated it. Great. Marluz, is there any final question or from, from your side? Maybe I missed something in the chat that you spotted. I think it's actually pretty much time that we move on uh, to <laughs> back to Sarah for some housekeeping announcements. Um, but first, we should we should thank you so much, <laughs> Melissa, for taking the time to come here and uh, join us at ICE Young and give this amazing uh, plenary. No, yep, thank you all. Have a great conference as well, and I'll try and join the opera if I can today. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you so much. All right, let's see. I'm gonna add myself to the spotlight, which is a bit of an awkward thing to do, but here I am. So I don't have much housekeeping to share here. I would actually like you to all come over to the Buvetta and that's where we're gonna do all of our housekeeping. Um, we have a very exciting event for you planned. It's a bit of a welcome event. It's gonna share a lot of need to know information for you. So I ask you all to join me there right now. I think Sophie is posting the link in the chat. Um, and that's all from my side. There will be more in the, in the Buvetta. So back to you, Danielle and Marluz, for the goodbye. Okay. Great. So yeah, no, I, I hope you enjoyed this, um, this morning plenary session. We had two amazing speakers. We were very excited that they, they came and joined us. And, and the discussion from the rest of you was also very engaging. So I thank you for that. I look forward to the rest of the conference. Marluz. Yeah, okay. So thanks a lot also to our great speakers, Melissa and Maria. Um, we have saved all the questions that you have posted in the chat. So um, if you don't get a chance to um, to catch our speakers during the rest of this conference, um, maybe there is um, a way for them still to get in touch with you. Well, of course, there is the conference app. If uh, oh, I right. suppose we should check to see if mm -hmm. they're all involved there. But yeah. Okay, so I think over to the Bouvette for uh, what awaits us there. I think Sarah will attribute. Yep, the link is posted, so we'll see you again in a moment in the Bouvette.